Channel 4 News is at 7.45. First of all, we hear from theologian Dr. Robert Beckford, who presents some challenging views on the Twelve Disciples. Christians like me believe that 2,000 years ago, a group of 13 men met in a small room in Jerusalem to eat a Last Supper. The Last Supper is one of the world's most iconic images, famously painted by Leonardo da Vinci. The 13 men present are some of the most important people in the history of the world. According to the Bible, the Last Supper was the moment when Jesus announced to his 12 closest followers that he was about to die. That night, he was arrested, tried, and the following morning, he was crucified. It was a turning point for Jesus and his followers. His death could have spelt disaster for his new movement. Instead, it became one of the defining moments in the Christian story at Easter. I believe the world today more than ever needs committed disciples, people prepared to dedicate their lives to help others to fight injustice and oppression wherever it is found. So I'm going to go on a journey around the world to investigate the disciple stories and see how they've been used by the later church. How some of them are heroes, while others are evil villains. And why some of Jesus' closest followers have been excluded. And to reveal the secrets of the 12 disciples. My search for the secrets of the Twelve Disciples begins in the ruins of one of the most important Roman cities in Asia Minor, Ephesus. When Leonardo da Vinci started painting The Last Supper in 1495, he was following a religious code that had its origins in the years after Jesus' death, a code that has shaped the Christianity we know today. I believe the real inspiration for this painting didn't come from da Vinci, but from another man 1,500 years earlier. According to the Bible, 40 days after the events of the Last Supper, the 12 disciples met again in the same room. The Holy Spirit descended on them and filled them with a new mission to go out as apostles to spread the message of Jesus. On a hillside above the ruins of Ephesus is a cave that is believed to have been dedicated to the real architect of Christianity, the first person to mention the Last Supper and the real brains behind the way it has been portrayed for the last 2,000 years. The Apostle Paul. But Paul wasn't at the Last Supper. He never met Jesus in the flesh and only converted after the crucifixion. I believe it was Paul's interpretation of the Last Supper and the role of the 12 disciples that has shaped the Christianity we know today. I would say that Paul was the most important figure in early Christianity. He was the one who left the important teaching of his alive till today. And he became almost better known than the Twelve. Paul overshadowed all the other apostles. He was one of the greatest disciples of Jesus Christ. Paul's story dominates the New Testament. Of the 27 books, 13 are accredited to Paul himself and two more to his followers. 
It was Paul that radically transformed Jesus' new movement from a Jewish sect into the Christianity we know today. But given that Paul's message was so different, so radical as you've said, did some of the disciples resent him? We don't know exactly, although we have some uh, hints um, that there were reactions. Pauline letters uh, uh, were not accepted by all early Christians. Uh, there were some hostile reactions against Paul. Today, Paul is rightly revered as one of the central pillars of the early church. But 2,000 years ago, he faced a desperate struggle to get acceptance from the people who'd been closest to Jesus, the 12 disciples. Although later the church would try and play down the conflict, you can see it on the pages of the New Testament itself. A battle for the future direction of the new movement between those who wanted it to remain a narrowly Jewish sect and Paul, who wanted to widen its scope to the entire pagan world. Paul's main opponents in the battle for the future shape of Christianity can be found in da Vinci's painting too, although their real identities are hidden. Right on the very edges of the Last Supper are three disciples, Jude, Simon and James. But the Bible is strangely silent about them. The most intriguing question about these three is why we know so little about them. Why are they so obscure? After all, the disciples were the celebrities of their day. Is it because the gospel writers and later church fathers preferred that they remained in the shadows? Is it that their anonymity was no accident, but a deliberate ploy to hide a secret about their true origins? The names are interesting. James, Simon, and a Jude. He's also called uh, Thaddeus. So some people know that name. So what I noticed and what other scholars have noticed is these names strangely correspond to the names of the brothers of Jesus. Just as today in Jewish society, family was extremely important in first century Jewish Palestine too. Like any other Orthodox Jew, Jesus had a family. A mother, a father, four brothers, and at least two sisters. But it seems that later Christian writers did their best to vilify them. One of the things that has stuck in a lot of people's heads, if you do mention the brothers of Jesus, they'll say, oh, but they didn't believe in him. Where is it in the Bible? There's one passage, one passage in the Gospel of John, chapter 7, where Jesus is going to go down to Jerusalem and the brothers say, well, why don't you reveal yourself publicly? And the gospel writer comments, they did not yet believe in him. It seems that Jesus' Jewish family was an embarrassment for the church. They couldn't be completely erased from the records as they were too well known. But as far as possible, any mention was kept to a minimum. They're living as Jews. They are Jews in every way. They're keeping the Jewish law, the Sabbath, the festivals. They are thinking of themselves as messianists, I think would be the word, uh, not Christian. What James, Judas, and Simon believed stood in stark contrast to what most Christians, including myself, believe about Jesus today. They didn't see themselves as Christians, but as Galilean Jews who had no interest in setting up a new religion, but reforming the old one. And they saw Jesus, their brother, as a Zadik, a righteous Jew, a teacher with a new code of ethics that could help people live a good life. The later Christian belief that Jesus was the Son of God, born of a virgin, who was sacrificed, then resurrected to save the world from sin, would have been completely alien to them.
Hidden away in the Armenian quarter of the old city of Jerusalem is an ancient cathedral dedicated to St. James, the brother of Jesus. According to tradition, his body is buried beneath the church. Why is James so important in the Armenian tradition? He is considered the head of the apostles, as it is described in the book of Acts. But particularly here in this cathedral, we have his body. He is buried here under the throne of the patriarch. And this cathedral is dedicated to his memory. In the Bible, if you decode the book of Acts of the Apostles, what emerges is that James was a key figure in the history of the early church. In fact, he took charge of the church after Jesus' death, not Peter and Paul, as later church tradition would have us believe. Countless later sources confirm him as the first bishop of Jerusalem, the headquarters of the new movement. According to an alternative story, it's hidden in the New Testament, but it's actually in the New Testament, but it's everywhere in later records. When Jesus dies, he turns things over to his brother James, not to Peter. According to all of our early sources, James is in charge. Jesus' brother is in charge of the movement. And after James's death, it was another of Jesus' brothers, Simon, who followed him as leader of the new movement. The Jesus family dynasty continued for at least another hundred years before disappearing from the pages of history. So what's going on here is an attempt by those writers that support Paul above James. They can't completely erase James and the brothers, but they, they minimize it. There's no passage in the New Testament where James gets the authority given by Jesus. And yet outside the New Testament, it's everywhere. The victors get to tell the story. The Jesus family began to lose control of the new movement when the Romans destroyed the Jewish temple in Jerusalem in AD 70, after a long and bloody siege. The focus of Christianity then moved to a new city, the capital of the Roman Empire, Rome. And from then on, Christianity did its best to consign the family to the shadows, a hidden secret about Jesus' life. There's a, a sort of an ugly subject that's uh, hidden in all this. Um, Anti-Semitism is the word for it. I think if you ask the question, why are the three mystery apostles a mystery? Why is James, the leader, not mentioned and emphasized? It's ultimately because of what they represent. It's not just let's hate the family for no reason. They represent an alternative version of the faith that is very Jewish and that stays Jewish to the end. And I think there's such a distaste for that later. We have texts of early Christians past the New Testament to say, we have nothing in common with the Jews. There's this, and, and even the word Jew becomes the kind of word that you spit out, the Jews. That's why I think the family is written out it's because of what they represent. According to tradition, Paul was martyred in Rome in 64 AD. His grave is believed to lie below the Church of St. Paul's outside the walls of Rome. Above the apse is a massive golden mosaic that illustrates the victory of Paul's version of Christianity. Paul is depicted at the right hand of Jesus, with his key follower, Luke, by his side. And beneath him, at his feet, are the other disciples. If we were to rewrite the list of the disciples today, where would we place Paul? Would he be at the top? Would he be the 13th? No, uh, he would be uh, uh, the first. Uh, 
uh, because the Christianity we have is in, in fact the Pauline Christianity, I would have put him uh, first because even the church has accepted him as a first. Although Paul wasn't present at the Last Supper or the events that followed it, it was his version of Christianity that triumphed. It was his later followers that created and used the stories of the 12 disciples to fit their own purpose. In the next part, we see how they took the story of the greatest disciple, the Prince of the Apostles, Peter, and used him to give the head of the church in Rome his power to rule one billion Catholics. After Jesus himself, the 12 disciples are the most important figures in Christianity. Their example of dedication and self-sacrifice is supposed to be an inspiration for us all. But far too often, they have simply been used as symbols of power. The next stage of my journey required me to turn investigator. In an ancient city where the greatest of Jesus' disciples is supposed to be buried. It is here also that Christianity first made its leap from a tiny Jewish sect into a global religious empire. And also where the secrets of the early movement are still closely guarded. As Paul's new Christianity spread around the Roman world, it needed a head. Rome was the most important city, and so its bishop gradually took control of the new church. To legitimize that power, he also needed a link to the 12 disciples. Today, the Pope's authority over the world's one billion Roman Catholics derives from the belief that the disciple Peter died and was buried here almost 2,000 years ago. About 50 feet beneath where I'm standing lies a vast necropolis, an ancient graveyard that extends hundreds of feet beneath St. Peter's Basilica itself. It's thought to date back to Roman times, to the time of Jesus and the 12 disciples. 40 years ago, the Pope announced that Vatican archaeologists had made an incredible discovery, one that Catholics had been hoping for for hundreds of years. On the 26th of June, 1968, the Pope declared that the actual bones of St. Peter had been found. Every year in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, the largest in all of Christendom, Roman Catholics celebrate the Feast of the Chair of St. Peter. This feast celebrates the chair Peter is supposed to have first sat in when he came to Rome almost 2,000 years ago. We have the 12 apostles, and amongst those 12, a special place is, is given to, to Peter. We think especially of those words of Christ to Peter, you are Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. Why is Rome important for the church? Well, uh, in Christ's time, Rome was the most important uh, city of the Roman Empire. And so when the disciples wanted to make Christianity a uh, world religion and not confined to the Jews, it was natural that he would come to Rome, to the capital city of his world. How do you actually know that Peter actually came to Rome? Well, the New Testament doesn't give us any immediate evidence that Peter uh, came to Rome. Um, but a very early tradition, both that he, he came to Rome 
and that he was also uh, put to death here. So we have that evidence uh, in the early years after the birth of Christianity. There are no direct contemporary historical accounts of Peter coming to Rome, and there are some biblical scholars who dispute the Vatican's version of events regarding Peter's final burial place. For Peter, we cannot make a seriously strong case for Peter being in Rome. We have to rely on later legendary material. Acts of the Apostles stops talking about Peter in really after Acts 15, so really after the mid-first century, there is no mention of Peter. And this suggests that all these later stories are Christian inventions. In 1939, the Vatican began a huge archaeological dig underneath St. Peter's Basilica. Its purpose was to find concrete proof of the tomb of Peter and show once and for all that he had died and was buried in Rome. The dig was carried out in total secrecy. Only when it was finished was it revealed to the world. Dr. Olaf Brandt is the secretary of the Pope's own Christian Institute for Archaeology, the organization responsible for any excavations carried out on Vatican territory. What did the Vatican claim it had found? Well, uh, essentially, uh, St. Peter's tomb. How important a discovery was that, to find the graveyard and the tomb of St. Peter? It's important because it's fascinating. It's not important because it, I mean, it doesn't change anything. Uh, the, because the, um, uh, the, the tradition uh, of the church already said that Peter, that Peter uh, died in Rome, that he was buried in Rome. So uh, these excavations changed things only if you didn't believe in that tradition. So from the church point of view, it just confirmed what the tradition already said. Beneath the basilica, the archaeologists unearthed a huge Roman graveyard. So this is the uh, general view of part of the excavation. Exactly right. under the altar, they found what the Pope had been hoping for, a large memorial structure Everybody agrees that, this that the Pope declared was the tomb of St. Peter. The Pope then called in another Vatican expert, a close personal friend. This expert came up with an even bigger result, that she had found the actual bones of St. Peter. The announcement caused a storm of controversy in the academic world. We can make of this exactly what Pope Paul VI ordered to be written on the box where these bones are preserved. These bones are believed to be the bones of St. Peter. Paul VI probably believed those who are the bones of St. Peter, and that's fine. I know other pe persons who believe those to be the bones of St. Peter. In a scientific uh, context, it's difficult to uh, produce uh, evidence for it. But you are free to believe it. Or disbelieve it. Yeah. Why the story of Peter coming to Rome and the whereabouts of his tomb and bones matter so much is because the power and authority of the Pope to rule over one billion Roman Catholics derives from his direct link to Peter as the first Bishop of Rome, the first Pope. At the Church of St. Paul's, outside the walls of Rome, there is a portrait of every pope from Peter to the present day. But there are some scholars who dispute the historical accuracy of this list. If you want the most powerful church, you want to be linked to the most prominent apostle, which is, of course, Peter. These lists associated with popes and so on and bishops are largely later creations designed to give legitimacy to the faith of the Roman Church.
For me, the entire story of Peter and Rome appears to be shrouded in confusion, mystery, and vested interest. I needed an independent voice, someone who had tackled the story from the inside. I found an investigative journalist who is writing a book on the discovery of St. Peter's tomb. Given the fact that the church was behind the excavations and has, has controlled the flow of information, wouldn't it be fair to call this at least? That the church would be comfortable with, um, because we are not in the realm strictly of science. We're in the realm of science and faith. So I think that it's safe to say that they found a site that 150 years or 100 years after Peter's death, people thought was the grave of Peter. However, we're talking about a century, century and a half after Peter's death. Um, in a situation where his body was almost certainly not recovered. So the actual grave is it's a bit of a stretch. So <clears throat> a, a, a site that may have been venerated, mm -hmm. no concrete proof, mm -hmm. but definitely no bones. Definitely no bones that could be associated with Peter or with that particular monument. They were found in a box years later um, in a completely different um, area, in a work, uh, a storage room um, maybe 20 meters away from the actual site with a little faded uh, paper ticket explaining where they had come from. Whose bones were they? What, what, what did they actually find then? What did they attribute to these bones to? Uh -huh. Well, uh, remember, we're digging, they were digging in a, in a graveyard, um, so there would have been plenty of people to choose from. In this box were also the bones of several farmyard animals, um, sheep and um, oxen, and even the entire skeleton of a mouse. So it was a bit of a mishmash. Is this really what it means to be a disciple? A symbol of power based on a church tradition that some scholars now say has little basis in historical fact. That prompted a new pope desperate to make his mark by finding Peter's grave, to begin digging in total secrecy. And a Vatican-led investigation that found an ancient monument that the Pope declared is the tomb of Peter. And then a later Pope who claimed to have miraculously discovered the actual bones of Peter. I don't think it's beyond the realm of possibility that at certain points in this long drawn out affair, a word was whispered to someone inside the dig, a suggestion was made, certainly there was a conspiracy of the faith, an overwhelming gravity of belief that would have drawn people who see the real presence of Peter in the site to conclude that the results supported that, the pious conclusion rather than the scientific one. Since the excavations and the Pope's announcement of the discovery of Peter's remains, the Vatican has allowed the public into the tomb. But when we requested permission to film there, we were refused. So if Peter isn't here, where could he be? Is there an alternative explanation? If you look in the Bible, in the Acts of the Apostles, Peter's story is given in some detail. The story in Acts tells us where Peter was in the first century. Peter was in uh, the area around Palestine and Syria. So some people now think that Peter died in the mid first century, around the time when he disappears from the story in Acts, and he died in the area of Palestine or Syria, maybe. But certainly around the area of Palestine is the best guess, I think, for where Peter died. At almost the same time that the Pope announced to the world that he had found the tomb of St. Peter in Rome, 1,500 miles away, there was another discovery of an ancient grave on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. In 1953, two Franciscan monks were digging in a cave when they discovered hundreds of first century ossuaries, coffins, from the time of Jesus and the 12 disciples. As it happens with so many important discoveries, this happened uh, by chance. They were building a wall 
from one property to another property, and they started to discover um, ancient tombs with um, bones, uh, with ossuaries, and the most important thing, inscriptions. These Catholic archaeologists believed they had found the earliest physical evidence of a Christian community in Jerusalem, including some very familiar biblical names. We encountered the name of Jesus, of Joseph, of uh, Simon, uh, of Lazarus, of Zacharias, uh, of Martha, of Maria. <laughs> very common name in the time of, um, of Jesus. But one of them was a potentially explosive find. It read, Shimon bar Jonah, Simon son of Jonah, the original biblical name of the disciple Peter. Jesus called him Simon bar Jonas. So it was very interesting to, far, to find uh, not one uh, name only, but the two names, the name of the person and the name of uh, his uh, father. This time, there was no papal fanfare, no global announcement, absolutely no publicity. The official line was that this couldn't be the grave of Peter. He was buried in Rome. Surely they must have been intrigued because it's so clear, isn't it? Simon bar Jonah, Ju yes. Jesus uses that yes. name. Surely they must have thought that there was some connection there between this ossuary and Peter the disciple. Yes, sometimes you find the name together, but uh, you don't have to jump to the conclusions and uh, to say uh, it is uh, these known people and it is uh, another known people because uh, it can be also some unknown people with the same name. What would that mean for the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church if that archaeological evidence that they suggest was correct and he was buried here? Exactly. It's impossible because uh, the history and archaeology are together in, uh, in saying that Peter is in Rome. But if these ossuaries are dated, as you've said, in the first century, and then the traditions of Peter being in Rome are later, the second century, surely the archaeology and the history lies here with the ossuaries. The archaeology here is uh, in regard only to a name written on, the, uh, on, uh, on a box. There is no other proof than the, what is inside the box are the bones of, of Peter. Uh, instead, in, in Rome, the archaeology which is there is uh, related to a tradition. The original bone box with the Shimon bar Jonah inscription is now stored in a small Franciscan museum in Jerusalem. We wanted to see it, but when we asked, once again, our request to film was refused. If in fact Peter did die and is buried in Jerusalem, it would be earth-shattering for the Catholic Church. It would overturn a 1900-year tradition that has at its root papal power and authority over one billion Catholics. It would mean that Jerusalem, and not Rome, is the Church's headquarters. In the next part, we look at how Europeans have deployed the power of the Twelve Disciples to maintain their dominance of Christianity, and why the story of another disciple who left Palestine after Jesus' death to set up a church in the East has been so ignored by the West. Could the church in India be older than the one in Rome? In one of the most important passages in the New Testament, Jesus tells his followers to go and make disciples of all nations, to travel to the ends of the earth and spread his message. One disciple took this command literally and traveled further than the rest, but whose story has always been dismissed by Western scholars as Christian fantasy. According to tradition, just 20 years after Jesus' death, the disciple Thomas boarded a boat in Palestine and ended up in India. <laughs> Out 
Outside a small town on the west coast of India, every year there is a massive religious convention. More than 100,000 people come here from all over India to celebrate their Christian heritage. They claim to be one of the oldest Christian communities anywhere in the world, founded by one of Jesus' original disciples just 20 years after his death. If their story is true, the implications are huge. That Christianity reached India before large parts of Europe, including the British Isles. But until recently, most Western scholars claimed it was a physical impossibility that anyone could have crossed the Arabian Sea in the first century. And so it was ridiculous to suggest that Indian Christianity could have been founded by the disciple Thomas. This place is now called Kudungallur. Probably the first century port of Muziris was in this vicinity. I have come to meet one of India's leading experts on the story of Thomas and India. Using the monsoon winds, it was very easy for boats and ships to come from the east coast of Egypt to Muziris in Kerala. There is a second century Christian text, the Acts of Judas Thomas, that tells how the disciple Thomas traveled on a boat from Palestine via Egypt across the Arabian Sea to India, arriving in 52 AD at the court of King Gundafaras. Now, people said that he never came to Gandafaras, there was no such king. So the story of the Acts of Judas Thomas, it's all a cock and bull story, it's only a legend. But then in the 19th century, the coins of Gandafaras were discovered in large quantities. And now it is proved beyond any doubt that there was a constant trade going on between Kerala and Rome and Greece. So it was easy for him to come. There is more evidence for the arrival of Thomas in India than for the arrival of Peter in Rome. But Peter's arrival is accepted universally, at least by the Western world. But when you speak about Thomas's arrival, people are skeptical. According to this theory, when Thomas first arrived in India, he failed to him who had already been in India for hundreds of years, and amongst whom he could make his first converts, the Jews. Jews started coming to India at the time of uh, King Solomon to the west coast for trade. About, uh, 50,000 Jews were in that particular place. Our community in, in Kerala here goes back to 2,000 years. One of the oldest Jewish communities in South India was based at the synagogue of Chenamangalam. I was introduced to a living link to that ancient community, one of just a handful of surviving members still in Kerala. So there were Jewish communities here before there were Christians? Yes. Yeah, there's, yes. Uh, St. Thomas came much, very much later. Very, very much later. When Jews were here when St. Thomas came. Because after knowing the Jews were here in uh, down, St. Thomas came to India. And he came first to the Jews. He came, stayed with uh, in, uh, in uh, Krangano with the Jew, with Jews only. And from there he con uh, converted some Jews in, in Kerala itself. And how and many are the, left today? How many? We are now about uh, 52 people altogether in the whole Ke all of Kerala. 52. 52. After making his first converts amongst the Jewish community, Thomas is supposed to have gone out and set up seven churches around Kerala. 
One of those original seven is at Paravor, just outside Cochin. Tradition says that Thomas came across a group of Brahmins, Hindu priests, bathing in a pond. He then performed one of his most famous miracles. He threw some water and it froze in midair. This so impressed the Brahmins, they converted on the spot. Wow, couldn't go down this before. Is, uh, this is quite something. Of course, it's worth seeing. Wow. So tell me what happened here. When he landed, the church which you, we are going to see now was a temple at that time. Mm. And the festival, the festival was going on in the temple. And soon after his arrival, what St. Thomas did, he started preaching about Jesus Christ and Holy Bible. And the chief priest of the uh, temple and family got baptized using this part of this pond by the hands of St. Thomas, followed by about 1,700 people got baptized. 1,700? 1,770. 1,770. 70 people got baptized. This is what history says, religion says, you know. Fantastic. And St. Thomas is placed right at the top, right up above there. Jesus. Yes. While Thomas's role in the founding of Christianity is now accepted by some Indian scholars, those in the West mostly still dismiss it as pious fiction. I feel very proud, especially because only one country in Europe received the Christian faith during the time of the apostles, and that is Rome. Other countries in Europe, England or Germany, they get their faith only after the 6th century, after the 10th century, and so on. So at that time, this faraway land, India, which was considered the country of the black people. It's the country of uh, heathens, uh, non-believers, uh, who believed in uh, things like witchcraft or things like that. This country had the good fortune to receive this great faith in the first century from one of the direct disciples of Christ. I had been told that Kerala had another unique historical connection with its Christian past, another living link. Families who claim they are descended from the original converts of Thomas. They are known as the Nazranis, a name thought to derive from Nazareth, Jesus' birthplace. He considers St. Thomas as a spiritual father to him. Since the very beliefs were imparted to him through St. Thomas, St. Thomas definitely is a fatherly figure for him. Next to Jesus Christ, he keeps him, you know, as the connecting link. For want of a better word, you have a spiritual bloodline through St. Thomas all the way back to Jesus. Yep, 100%. St. Thomas is the man uh, no, who baptized uh, our, our forefathers. That's something great. We are very happy. This is a never-ending story, you know. It is going to live till the end of the world. The end of the world almost came for the Thomas Christians in the 16th century, when the first Europeans, the Portuguese, arrived to colonize Kerala, they were stunned to find that Christianity had preceded them and refused to accept it. In 1599, the Portuguese Archbishop Alexio de Menezes called a special synod here to bring the Thomas Christians under the control of Rome. When these decrees and acts of the Senate were put into execution, one after our, all our freedom was lost, or our rights were very much changed. They were Latinized, even the customs were Latinized. And 
In order to do that, he also ordered that all our books be brought here from every parish and they were burnt. Archbishop Menezes had authority from the Pope in Rome to force the Thomas Christians to join the Catholic Church by whatever means. He wanted to break the link to Thomas, so he ordered the church's archive to be destroyed. All the old priests were weeping. They wept. So this is really a place of some sadness. This is a great place of sadness for the uh, Thomas Christians. Our uh, native church lost its freedom. And our culture and our traditions and our liturgy, everything came to an end in this place in the year 1599. Here we lost our freedom. Today, 400 years after the Portuguese tried to eradicate the Thomas Church, Indian Christians have restored their spiritual link with Jesus' disciple. I was given a special audience with the current head of the Mar Thoma Christians, the Metropolitan, the Right Reverend Dr. Joseph Mar Thoma. So why did the Portuguese try to suppress this tradition? They said that it's all satanic. Satanic. Yeah. So the Portuguese suppressed it because they couldn't believe it was truly Christian. They saw it as and satanic. And truly Christian and Indian. And it, it couldn't and be Christian Indian, and Indian. Uh, Indian traditions, they thought that it is all anti-Christian. Today, the Martama Christians owe allegiance to no one. Every year, they celebrate their independence at a special convention held in Kerala. So, given this particular heritage that you have, how do you feel about those who say that Thomas didn't come here, and in fact the tradition is and made uh, up? I will say the same question. Is there any historical document that Peter has gone to go? No. Both rest on traditions. If the tradition in Rome is correct, the tradition in India is also correct. The later church was very happy to exploit the stories of the twelve disciples to legitimize its power and authority, as long as it benefited Europe. But when it came to India, it tried to eradicate the ancient link to Thomas, and this attempt to Europeanize the church didn't just stop with Thomas. In the next part, we will see how a disciple was deployed in Christianity's battle with another emerging faith, Islam. The 12 disciples were the first celebrities of the new Christian age. The later church made full use of their status to legitimize its power. They were also very useful in its battle with other faiths. And with one disciple, this even meant inventing a completely new story for him. Santiago de Compostela in northwestern Spain is one of the greatest pilgrimage sites in all of Christendom. Ever since its founding in the 9th century, millions of Christian pilgrims have come here to worship at what they believe is the tomb of one of Jesus' 12 disciples. Another James, one whom the church regards is greater than the brother of Jesus. 
Although originally born in Palestine, this James is now not only the patron saint of Compostela, but the protector of the whole of Spain. James is one of the only disciples whose death is actually recorded in the Bible. In the book of Acts, it describes how he was executed by King Herod Agrippa in AD 44 in Jerusalem. But the first mentions of James coming to Spain didn't appear until the 8th century, more than 700 years later. 20 miles north of Santiago, is the town of Padron, where according to tradition, after his death, James's body arrived in Spain. I wanted to know how it had got here from Jerusalem, nearly 3,000 miles away by sea. This is a long way from Palestine. Can you tell me the story of how James's body came to be here? From Palestine, there were boats arriving here originally bringing stone containing tin ore. It was this stone that was originally traded here from Palestine. That's why it's said that St. James arrived here in a stone boat. The cult of St. James appeared at a critical time for Europe. It was under attack from another emerging faith. Islam. Arab armies had already conquered large parts of Spain. A hero was needed to rally the Christian faithful. Who better than one of Jesus' disciples? St. James was considered as the, if you like, the symbolic patron of the Christian struggle against the Muslims of southern Spain. In the later Middle Ages, St. James is portrayed in art and in sculpture as Santiago Matamoros, the Moor Slayer. He's normally portrayed on horseback, sword in hand, slain enemies underneath the hooves of his horse. To promote the cult of St. James in Spain, it seems the church was prepared to believe in a totally new legend about his life. Under the altar of the church in Padron is a large stone pillar to which, according to the tradition, the boat carrying St. James's body was moored when it arrived by river 2,000 years ago. As you can see by that inscription, it says in Latin, Pia credito, which means by pious belief. But by pious belief, it does not necessarily mean that it's a fiction or that it's a fantasy. It has to be said that there's no definitive evidence that James um, had either traveled to Spain to preach or was buried in Spain until many, many centuries later. It's in the seventh century that we have the first reports or claims that James had traveled to Spain during his own lifetime to preach. Um, there's also a, a hymn of praise from the kingdom of Asturias in the north of Spain from the 780s, which makes the same claim. But none of these sources say that James was buried there. According to the tradition, James's body lay hidden in a secret cave for 700 years. Then a local hermit saw a star in the sky which guided him to the burial site. He told the local bishop, and several years later, the first shrine was built on the site, and the town of Santiago grew up around it. Today, a massive cathedral dominates the area. The dean, agreed to show me the cathedral's historical archive. We know that the tomb of St. James was discovered in approximately 830. Here we can see the illustration of the Archbishop Theodomir of Iria Flavia finding the tomb of the Apostle James. And here is the illustration of Alfonso II, and beside it, we find details of the privilege he granted the shrine. 
given that there were so many competing saints' cults, it was very important that a shrine had influential backers, that it had patronage, that it had publicists. And in the case of St. James, we know that members of the Asturian royal family were enthusiastic supporters. At the end of the 19th century, the cathedral authorities began a massive archaeological investigation beneath the cathedral. It was a time when Christianity was under attack from new developments in science and history. The religious authorities were desperate to find scientific evidence to reinforce the legend of St. James and keep the faithful happy. They first uncovered a vast Roman necropolis, an ancient cemetery, with tombs dating back to the first century. Then, right below the cathedral's main altar, the church's archaeologists found another ancient tomb. There they found the urn that contains the box that holds the remains of the apostle and his two disciples, St. Athanasius and St. Theodore. This was in 1879. Then there was a long process of authentication that lasted five years, and it was definitively decreed to be authentic by the Vatican on the 24th of July, 1884. Can you be sure about what you found? Can you be absolutely certain that here we have the bones of the Apostle? Now, in this case, there is a very high level of certainty. We could say that all reasonable doubt, whether these relics are authentic or not, has been overcome. In other words, certainty outweighs all reasonable doubt. Jose Suarez Otero is an independent local archaeologist. From an archaeological point of view, we cannot guarantee that it is actually the Apostle St. James who is buried there. The problem is that those remains may or may not be the remains of the Apostle St. James, and it will always be difficult to prove it either way. Is it important that the bones and the tomb are those of St. James. Everything that has been built here and the flow of pilgrims have both been because of this fact. Of course, it is in our best interests that it is never proven to be a calculated untruth, like some people nowadays claim it to be. If a shrine could flourish, large numbers of pilgrims would begin to visit that shrine. One important side product of pilgrims was they brought money to the shrine. And the bishopric of Santiago de Compostela becomes much richer. It seems to me that in its bid to create a new Christian hero to champion Europe's battle with Islam, the church lost sight of the real meaning of being a disciple. How they were prepared to commit their lives not to fight other believers, but to combat injustice and oppression all over the world. Exploiting the power of the 12 disciples did not just depend on owning a piece of them, it could be harnessed in other ways too. The first Christians realized that a sure way to get your sacred writings noticed was to claim that one of the disciples had written them. When it was being decided which text should be included in the New Testament, having such a big name author was a huge bonus, even if he didn't actually write it. According to tradition, the disciple who wrote the most was John. He is supposed to have authored a gospel, three letters, and one of Christianity's most extraordinary texts, the Book of Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants. Is there agreement 
amongst the scholars, amongst church traditions, that John wrote all of those pieces of writing in the New Testament. Well, the first portrait of this that we have is by a church father by the name of Irenaeus in the second century. And he tells us that there is a John uh, who was the beloved disciple uh, who wrote the gospel and he also received the revelation on the island of Patmos. Now, even as early as the third century, there was a Christian by the name of Dionysus who disagreed with this. Uh, he saw that there was potentially two Johns. And today, biblical scholars, they think there is perhaps even three Johns uh, that composed uh, these documents that we have in the New Testament. Many biblical scholars now believe that the books in the Bible traditionally attributed to John were actually written by three men. John the Evangelist, John the Presbyter, and John of Patmos. And that the disciple John might not have been any of them. Apostles' names get linked to uh, Gospels and sacred writings because uh, it's, it's, again, it's like the authority of cities. You need a big name attached to a Gospel or to a letter. So this is one of the key processes for the New Testament canonization, linking a letter or a Gospel or whatever with a big name. For some of the early Christians, it didn't matter if John had actually written all those books. What mattered was his name and the power and status it gave them as a brand. And the fact that when it was being decided which sacred text would be included in the New Testament, theirs would be top of the list. One of the books attributed to John is the New Testament's strangest text, full of violent and disturbing language, and one that has been used by some of the more extreme Christian fundamentalists to prophesy the end of the world and another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a great voice, If any man worshippeth the beast and his image, and receiveth a mark on his forehead, or upon his hand, he also shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. The Greek island of Patmos lies in the middle of the Aegean. Today, it is home to a Greek Orthodox monastery, but 2,000 years ago, it was a Roman penal colony. According to tradition, because of his preaching, the disciple John was exiled here by the Romans. It was here, in a cave, that he was supposed to have had a miraculous vision that became the Book of Revelation. The melon of anthropology the fathers of the Eastern Church were always wary about the interpretation of this book, and the Church took care, one could say, to keep this book hidden away, not to use it too much. Of course, in the West, there have been lots of interpretations, some of which are extreme. Like many people, I find the book is full of disturbing images and written in a code that's hard to understand. Here is wisdom. He that hath understanding, let him count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred and sixty-six. Six, six, six. Now in the ancient world with languages like Greek and Hebrew, uh, letters represented so most scholars today believe that 666 represents, in Hebrew, Neron Kaiser or Caesar Nero. And so this fits very well uh, with the whole historical background of Revelation, with the suicide of Nero in AD 66 leading up then to this year of the four emperors. Some scholars now believe the coded language in the book of Revelation was designed to disguise the real purpose of its author, an attack on the Roman Empire. There's the beast out of the sea, and most scholars would interpret that uh, beast in this way. And directly to the west is the Aegean Sea, and every year the Roman governor coming from Rome uh, would come to the province of Asia by ship to be that representative of the emperor. Uh, he's that figurehead, that uh, beast out of the sea. 
For most historians, the book of Revelation is referring to a particular moment in time and a particular audience who understood its code. But today, some Christian fundamentalists believe it contains another message, one that can be used to prophesy the end of the world. Was that they believe very strongly that they were playing a very important role in the unfolding of biblical events in our time. Um, that, that these events in Waco were prophesied in the book of Revelation and that if they were to surrender to the FBI, they would lose their souls. They truly believe... His the most FBI. beloved disciple on Patmos, on the day of the Lord, was in the spirit. And the Lord says, I'm going to show you. What I'm going to do with this world, it will go through all of trials and tribulations, but the center part, and you can read it in Revelation, will be Jerusalem. The two witnesses. Millions of Christian Zionists, like Jan William van der Hoven, believe the book of Revelation prophesies that a final battle between good and evil will be fought in Jerusalem. You can see how true the revelation is, because it says there will be two witnesses or prophets like Elijah and Moses in that kind of power. And they will prophesy judgments on the people who in their, sorry, in their homosexual, decadent, self-serving, animalistic uh, uh, ways of life that the world more and more chooses. We have to serve what is in us, our pleasure. So if you serve the beast, the animal inside yourself long enough, you won't mind it when the beast is being put by the devil and says, now you serve him, you worship him outside yourself. Christian Zionists believe that before Jesus can return to earth, Jews have to return to the homeland. Israel must be permitted to continue its occupation of Palestinian lands and a new Jewish temple must be built in the center of Jerusalem. But if the temple has to be rebuilt for the Messiah to return, according to Revelation, yeah. what you're telling me about yeah. Revelation, what's going to happen to the mosques up there? What's going to happen to Muslims in Jerusalem if the temple has to be rebuilt? How does that work? I, I, I don't want to be wiser than God. They have built their mosques on the places where the Jewish temple stood and deny now that there was a Jewish temple. Whoever the person was who wrote the book of Revelation, most scholars think it certainly wasn't John the disciple, but his name has been used to authenticate one of the most controversial and dangerous books of the Bible. And the consequences are with us today, as millions of Christian Zionists use it to justify their support of Israel's continuing occupation of Palestinian lands. Is bringing Jews back then part of helping to fulfill Absolutely. the Absolutely. It's part of fulfilling Oh, I was yesterday with a Dutchman, and he says, there are people now going all over the world to the Jews in Argentine, in Brazil. And says, bring Go them home. back. Yes, but, yes. But, 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 but if they all come back, what's going to happen to the Palestinians who are here, how does that get played out in Revelation? The Arabs have more than 21 nations. So they can go if, elsewhere? I would say to the Arabs, if you want to be an Israeli Arab, you're welcome. Ahlem is Ahlem. But if you don't want to be an Israeli, you have 21 nations to choose from. So they can go elsewhere? Yes. I think we can clearly say that Revelation is the most abused book in the Bible. Even through the history of the, the canon for 2,000 years, uh, it's been subject to abuse. God does not want to frighten mankind. God, the Church, the teachings of Jesus Christ, the Gospel, our traditions of the Eastern Church, none of them want to scare mankind. In the next part, we look at one of the most famous disciples, one who for the last 2,000 years has been portrayed as the greatest villain in Christian history. But does Judas deserve his wicked reputation? Or is what he did a perfect example of what it means to be a disciple? Now, when the evening was come, 
he sat down with the twelve. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. This is the moment Leonardo da Vinci intended to capture in his famous painting, the instant at which Jesus announces to his disciples that he was to be betrayed. All 12 disciples seem to be in a state of shock and bewilderment, except, of course, for Judas. By painting him in shade, da Vinci singled Judas out with his arm on the table signifying his bad character and grasping his blood money to show his greed. All deliberately coded signs to highlight his treacherous act. For the last 2,000 years, Judas has been Christianity's bad disciple. The holy city of Jerusalem is the place where Christianity began. The setting for the passion of Jesus, his death and resurrection. I want to follow the trail of Jesus' last hours, and in particular, the part played in them by the disciple Judas. Just outside the city walls is the traditional site to which pilgrims and tourists are taken to hear the story of the Last Supper. During the Passover, the Last Supper. And the Last Supper, it was preparing in the together, this pray together, work place together, here. and, and here they ate Peter, together. That is one of but the hall was much bigger and very behind. different. Since According to the tourist guides, it is here that Jesus had his last meal with his 12 disciples and named the man who would betray him. Jesus came here. Jesus said that somebody will trade him, be traded, yes, by Judah in this holy place. Traditionally, the view of Judas is almost wholly negative. Judas Iscariot is everything Jesus of Nazareth is not. For example, where Jesus is selfless, Judas is selfish. Where Jesus is giving, Judas is greedy and seeks to take. Where Jesus gives of himself and sacrifices his life for the benefit of humanity and therefore represents God's incarnation and God's presence here on earth, Judas seeks to profit financially from this event and in fact represents evil incarnate on earth. Since Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, the only thing which is authentic here is the stone. Here was there is little historical evidence to suggest this is the actual site of the Last Supper. The current building was built by the Crusaders in the 12th century. But there is another alternative site for the Last Supper that gets far less publicity. It is in the convent of St. Mark's Syriac Orthodox Church within the walls of the old city itself. Some believe it has a stronger claim to be the authentic upper room as it is now underground, at the level Jerusalem streets would have been 2,000 years ago. The real last supper it is down, we can show it. Okay. Metropolitan Severius Morad of the Syriac Orthodox Church agreed to show it to me. And thank God we are now in the real Last Supper where our Lord Jesus Christ met here uh, in this upper room. First he finished the Pascha of Jewish and after that he wash the feet of his disciples and the last he gave him his body and the blood. How do you understand Judas in your tradition? We believe that Judas himself, he, he made this big wrong, especially he loved the money. 
you can call someone a Judas and people understand what you mean. You're saying that I'm disloyal. You're saying I'm a betrayer. You're saying I'm a traitor. I'm not a good person. We can look back at the first century and see that Judas and Jesus were two of the most popular names that you could give a Jewish son. By the time we get to the fourth century and we have the establishment of the official Christian religion with the Emperor Constantine converting, the name Judas completely drops off the map. He signifies everything that's wrong with being a disciple. That is right. In our church, he is bad disciples. For that, we lost him. Our church forgets them forever. As the New Testament was being written, the Bible writers made the most of Judas's allotted role as the bad disciple in the story of Jesus's death. And there's a clear progression of Judas uh, in the Gospels. We know from the very first Gospel, the Gospel of Mark, that Judas hands Jesus over to the authorities for some sum of money. When we get to the Gospel of Matthew, we have details such as Judas being paid 30 pieces of silver. But by the time we get to Luke, Luke Acts, Judas is overcome by Satan. And the idea is that he allowed to John, Judas is Satan, evil incarnate on earth. For the next 2,000 years, whenever the Last Supper was painted, Christian artists used a series of coded visual devices to signify Judas's evil nature. In sum, he was given a black halo to make him stand out from the other disciples. In others, he was depicted sitting the opposite side of the table to the rest of the Twelve. And in Da Vinci's painting, he was seen to be grasping his blood money, the reward for his evil treachery. The Bible tells us almost nothing about Judas as a person, his background, his family, or even how he became a disciple. Whenever he is mentioned, it's always in connection to his supposed betrayal of Jesus. But one of the clue we have is found in his name, Judas Iscariot. One interpretation of his surname is that he came from here, Kerioth, a small, isolated village in Judea. But even that was used against him when later Christian writers claimed that because he was the only disciple not born in Galilee, that was another possible reason for his treachery. Today, Christian pilgrims come to Jerusalem to follow the route that Jesus took as he was led to his crucifixion 2,000 years ago. From the Middle Ages onwards, the story of Jesus' life and death has been enacted all over the world in special passion plays. In Mexico, at the climax of their play, they even carry out a ritual execution of Judas. Judas was always used to represent evil. He is the scapegoat. He is the fall god. We will pay you 30 pieces of silver. Sometimes the actors portraying Judas would be physically beaten, uh, would be shamed by the society. It was not a role that you coveted uh, if you were going to participate in the Passion Play. It's not just Judas Iscariot, the historical figure uh, that becomes vilified. What we have is the name Judas become synonymous or equal to Jewish.
And so we have Jesus and the other 11 disciples become Christians, become Gentiles, and Judas remains the only Jew. When he becomes associated with the Jewish people, we see an unbelievable rise in anti-Jewish violence. People would lose their lives. They would be humiliated publicly. And part of this is owed to the idea that Jews are Christ killers or God killers. Although Judas was once one of Jesus' closest followers, for most Christians, his supposed act of betrayal transformed him into an outcast, a traitor, the exact opposite of what a true disciple should be. So, there are no patron saints, no shrines, no cult of relics for Judas, no gospels or letters in the Bible with his name attached, no churches named after him, and no prayers or hymns sung in his memory. I even feel uncomfortable mentioning his name in this church, the holiest in Christendom, the place where most Christians believe Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead. The trouble is that some scholars now believe that Christianity's 2,000-year-old character assassination of Judas is based on the faulty translation of a single Greek word. Verily I say unto you, one of you which eateth with me shall betray me. The word that is translated as betray in English, in Greek is parodidomi, and it doesn't mean betray. It means to hand over. The most common examples of this come in terms of military conquest. When one general has been vanquished by another, he will symbolically hand over his sword, property, and his soldiers to the general who has conquered him. But we see it translated as betray in English, and this is incorrect. The mistranslation of this word, transforming Judas into a traitor, is now thought only to have appeared when later church fathers first translated the Bible into Latin in the third century. But that is a revolutionary idea for most Christians it who is. believe in the traditional view. You're suggesting that they have demonized him based on a misinterpretation <laughs> yes. of the word to betray. Yes, and as Christians, we believe that Jesus was handed over to the authorities and that it was necessary for him to go to the cross and die and that this was part of God's plan. What if God chose a human being, Judas, who was not divine, who was fully human, to be part of this? What does that say about God, that perhaps God can use us to help in the salvation of other human beings? According to the Bible, after supposedly betraying Jesus with a kiss, Judas realizes the enormity of what he has done and tries to hand back the blood money to the Jewish high priests. He then flees the city to a place known as Hakuldama, the field of blood, where he commits suicide. Although today the hill is full of rock tombs, Judas's body has never been found. In the eyes of the church, by committing suicide, Judas compounded his sin, a sin for which some say he cannot be forgiven. Today, on the top of the hill above Hakeldama, there is the Greek Orthodox monastery of Saint Onifrius. Could he ever be forgiven for what he did? Uh, I don't think so. According to the gospel again, if uh, Christ himself uh, told us that uh, it was better not to have been born, he took his life, his life himself. 
because he took his life, yeah, he can't yeah. be forgiven. The life belongs to God. Life belongs to God. Yeah, yeah. With this new scholarly research, I wanted to know if the largest Christian church would now change its attitude to Judas. I believe that it would be very difficult for the church to change its position in relation to Judas. I even believe that it would be impossible because there are no factors which could cause it to change its position. All that we know has already been revealed. I don't see any new factors that could offer further insights beyond what we already know. In my search for the Twelve Disciples, it seems that the man singled out by the Church as the ultimate example of a bad disciple could in fact be quite the opposite. Could it be that the Last Supper, as we know it, is a callous distortion of the original event? That there was no betrayal, no disciple corrupted by greed, and no treacherous kiss in the Garden of Gethsemane? But that instead, what Judas did was the act of a faithful disciple without which there would have been no sacrifice, no resurrection, and no Christianity as we know it. For 2,000 years, has Judas's reputation been cruelly manipulated by the church? Is it now time to replace the image of Judas the traitor with Judas the hero? In the final part, my investigation takes me beyond the traditional list of the 12 disciples to see how the church deliberately excluded some of Jesus' original followers, and also to find out the real significance of these 12 people, why they are still so important for the world, and how anyone can become a disciple. My journey to uncover the secrets of the 12 disciples is now almost complete. I have already investigated the church's disputed claim that Peter came to Rome and how it gave the papacy its power. How a legend was created to miraculously transport James from Palestine to Spain to help the church defeat Islam. Of John who lent his name to one of the most controversial books of the Bible, but almost certainly didn't write it. Of Thomas, whose epic journey to the East has been dismissed by scholars in the West. Of the three mystery disciples whose real identities remained hidden because they were Jesus' brothers and too Jewish for the later church. And of Judas, whose evil treachery derived from the mistranslation of a single Greek word. And then, of course, there is the most important disciple of all, the one who has had the biggest impact on the Christianity we know today, and the man most responsible for the way we now understand the events surrounding the Last Supper, even though he wasn't there, the Apostle Paul. But are these the only disciples? Surely there is a glaring omission, one that has a direct bearing on how the church is governed today. Something that still causes division and bitter conflict throughout the Christian world. The complete lack of any female disciples. If there had been even one, there would be no debate today about women priests, bishops, and even the possibility of a female pope. finished writing his letter to the Romans here in Corinth, he needed someone who was trustworthy, reliable, and with sufficient authority to deliver it to the Christian community in Rome. So who did he choose? A leader of the church in Corinth. Someone he describes in the letter as a patron, a deacon, a serving minister within the church. But this wasn't a man, it was a woman. 
called Phoebe. A few miles away from Corinth are the remains of an ancient Roman port. Forty years ago, the sunken ruins of a 4th century church were discovered here. Some believe it was dedicated to Phoebe. Phoebe was probably a wealthy woman because St Paul calls her a benefactor or patroness, um, prostatus in the Greek. So she was a woman of some eminence possibly and substance. What does this powerful story of Phoebe mean to women in the church today? What does it say? It says to me that women were a part of the hierarchy, they were a part of the community, they were vital for its spread and its growth, and those, those possibilities are all available today. The image of God, which St. Paul says we are called to show forth, is not male. The image of God is not female. The image of God is male and female. The two become one, one flesh. I mean, hey, inconceivable that you could have a single-sex kingdom of God. Phoebe is not the only powerful woman in the story of the early church. In fact, the New Testament is full of them. There is, of course, Mary, Jesus' mother, and Mary Magdalene, one of his most famous followers. But there is also Joanna, Susanna, Priscilla, Tryphena, Tryphosa, Persis, and Julia. And then a certain woman called Junia, whom Paul describes as outstanding among the apostles. This title so offended later Christians that they tried to alter it. No one could uh, imagine that uh, uh, a female could have been called an apostle. So the junior, uh, the woman junior became Junia's a man. A man. Uh, and fortunately, we have now um, evidence, um, textual evidence that uh, indicate that uh, it was originally uh, a woman. So you're saying that there was an attempt to make Junia masculine in order to right. hide her, her feminine nature? Yes, these uh, women um, were downplayed. And in my view, this happened because the tradition in uh, the society was not ready to accept uh, these radical uh, uh, changes introduced by early Christianity. Outside the Bible, there is more evidence for the crucial role played by women in the early church. An early Christian text written in the second century, describes the life of a young follower of Paul, a woman called Thecla. At Selifke, in modern-day Turkey, there are the remains of a cult center dedicated to her memory. A local historian, Silal Taskaran, agreed to show me the underground church. Saint Thecla is the student of Saint Paul. She was a young girl mm. and she was going to be married. But after have heard the speech of St. Paul, mm. she decided to be Christian. According to her story, Thecla gave up everything and followed Paul all over Asia Minor as he preached the new Christian faith. She was pursued by her angry parents who wanted her back and several times she was arrested and even faced death. She found refuge in this cave, where at the end of her life, she is believed to have miraculously disappeared. That's a site of a miracle. Yes, in right. there. So people would have the windows here yeah. so they could see yeah. the place where the miracles took place. That's right. Later Christians built a huge complex in Thecla's memory. The original basilica was over 80 meters long. At the time, it was one of the biggest churches in the world and attracted thousands of pilgrims. Christianity has taught, you know, not by Jesus Christ himself, but by his apostles, 12 apostles, 
especially by his uh, St. Paul, you know. Mm -hmm. But they were all men. But as women, we see, we find only Ayatollah as a teacher for the new faith. Thekla's story shows how in the early church, women could be teachers and evangelists in their own right. Paul describes Thekla as the apostle equal to the other apostles, a rare and significant title, particularly as she was a woman. All of this is more proof that powerful female figures like Thekla existed in the early church and that these women too should be counted amongst Jesus' disciples. At the cave of St. Paul in Ephesus, there is some extraordinary visual evidence that illustrates the negative attitude of the later church fathers to women. Next to the ancient image of Paul, there is another painting of Thecla. Both of these paintings are roughly the same size, and both have their right hand raised in the classic Christian gesture of the teacher. So in the mind of the original artist, both Paul and Thecla had equal authority, a confirmation of the early church's sexual equality. But both of Thecla's eyes and her right hand have been scratched out. Originally, it was thought that this had been done by Muslims. But if it had been, Paul would have been damaged too. It's now thought that this was the handiwork of later Christians who were so unhappy with the idea that Paul, a man, would share his authority with a woman. It seems even Paul, the most powerful of all the disciples, was subject to the will of the later church. The radical message he inherited from Jesus was in turn watered down by his later followers. But it is that message which is the most important reason for my journey. The message that inspired all the disciples to give up their lives and attempt to change the world for the better. My purpose in investigating the 12 disciples was because I believe the world now needs disciples more than ever. So to find out what it takes to be a disciple today, my investigation has now brought me home to the north of England. In October 2004, there was a brutal murder of a local prostitute. Police officers out in force again this afternoon, hunting for the rest of the remains of Lindsay Bourne. In the same year, a group of Christian women decided to set up an aid organization to help the city's street prostitutes. They called themselves the Joanna Project, inspired by one of Jesus' original female disciples. There's this woman um, character in the New Testament. She decided to give up her, her status, give up all she has to follow Jesus and became his disciple. And we just thought it's such a good example. When Jesus was in the Bible, he went to the places where society said, you know, you shouldn't go. He went completely against mm -hmm. everything that society thought of as acceptable. The women to me are, are friends and are people that I value and I love. And, and it's just, that's my motivation. Okay. How are you doing anyway? Oh, no, Isn't this risky? Because there have been a lot of prostitutes have been killed up and down the country. There have even been problems here in Leeds. There is a degree of risk, but then I think there is a, yeah, I think life is risky. We have a people carrier, which is like a mobile drop-in. So we, we normally drive around the area, and whenever we see girls standing around, especially in such cold nights, um, it's all about friendship. Have you ever heard of Teen Challenge? It's like a residential rehab in Wales. You know, you come off drugs, yeah, that, that's not really, you just, you can knock yourself in a room and come off them. But they um, deal with, like, all the issues, all about you being able to have a new life and actually having a new start. Last year, the Joanna Project worked intensively with 12 Leeds prostitutes. 
Six of them are now off the streets and drug free. It seems to me that you're saying that discipleship isn't just about a title, it's a way of life, it's an action. Oh, totally. It's not just an instant transformation, it's a journey, it's learning, it's walking alongside the women and, and supporting them, crying with them, laughing with them, having fun with them, and it's just about doing life with people. Right, thank you very much for talking to us. So thank nice you for talking to us, more like. The fact is that anyone can be a disciple, anyone prepared to follow the message that Jesus first spelt out to his disciples in Palestine in the first century. It doesn't matter whether you are male or female, rich or poor, black or white, of whatever creed, color or nation. It doesn't matter if you believe all the legendary stories about the 12 disciples or whether you accept all the things they are supposed to have done and said. The secret of being a disciple is not about power or authority for the church. It's not about worshipping relics or where a particular disciple is buried, or even about who wrote which bit of the Bible. What it is, is a way of life spelt out 2,000 years ago by the followers of Jesus. What is important is that they were willing to drop everything, to commit their entire lives, to follow Jesus, to take up his powerful message to oppose injustice and oppression wherever it's found. If you follow this path, you too can be a disciple. If you want to follow up the issues raised in this program, go to Channel 4's Faith and Belief website. The address is channel4.com slash belief. Tomorrow night from 10.35 on Channel 4, from betrayal to crucifixion, it's Mel Gibson's brave and brutal religious film drama, The Passion of the Christ. Next tonight, Samir Ahmed and Easter Sunday's Channel 4 News.